Hello, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are around the world. Thanks for joining today's webinar from Real Story Group on the Dam Trends to Watch in 2021. My name is Scott Dale. I'm on the business development team here with Real Story Group. And uh, as you can see, my colleague, Jared Jingris, our lead dam analyst and managing director, uh, is with us here as well. He's going to be taking us through the, the heart of today's presentation. But uh, as we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple uh, housekeeping items of note and give you a quick um, little synopsis of Real Story Group and who we are, because I do see uh, a number of new folks uh, on the webinar with us today. So um, during the presentation today, um, you will be able to, uh, if you ask questions, uh, if we have time, we'll get to those. If not, we'll be sure to reach out to you afterwards uh, to answer those questions. And then for all of you uh, attending today, you'll be getting access to the slides. Uh, from today's session and a recording uh, will be available on our website uh, over the next uh, couple of days. To get started, uh, I want to talk about how Real Story Group typically engages with our customers. So we really have three different offerings that we make available to you. The first is uh, our vendor selection advisory. So for example, if you're in the process of evaluating DAM vendors right now, what you can do is subscribe to our research and then uh, utilize the decision tools that are included with that research to develop a short list and um, compare the vendors side by side. You can also uh, add some advisory time with Jared and the rest of our analyst team to really put an outside perspective into uh, your short list, validate uh, what you're looking at, and uh, really give you that real story about what those vendors do well and what they don't do so well. We also have an offering where you can subscribe to all of our research. And this is when you're taking a little bit more of a holistic view of your MarTech stack. Uh, so not just DAM, but areas like web content management, customer data platforms, et cetera. And then get a, a larger bucket of advisory hours that you can use throughout the year where we take on somewhat of a wingman role uh, within um, your, your organization to really help you to make the right decisions when it comes to selecting the different technologies that make up your, uh, the fundamental pieces of your MarTech stack. We also have a leadership council available. So um, this is by application only, but we meet four to five times per year and it allows for MarTech stack leaders at typically Fortune 500 organizations to really learn from each other, bounce some ideas, what's working well, what's not working well. Every meeting has a central theme. So for example, uh, our upcoming meeting on June 17th is preparing for uh, a, a cookie list future. So, if that's interesting to you, let us know. We'd be happy to, to share more details. And when you think about uh, Real Story Group, we what we do is evaluate vendors um, that make up the the Martech stack. If you think of your Martech stack almost as a as a mall, the analogy at the the analogy we like to use is the we're the anchor, cover the anchor store of your Martech mall. Uh, so as I mentioned, DAM, customer data platforms, web content management. And what this map provides you is an outline of the different vendors that we cover in each of those spaces. What's different about RSG versus other analyst firms you may have worked with in the past is the fact that we never work for or advise the vendors that we cover in any way. So whether they subscribe to our research or not does not matter to us. Uh, what matters to us is that we're providing you uh, as a technology end user and buyer um, with a pull no punches look at what those vendors do well, what they don't do so well, and what's going to be the right fit uh, for what it is that you're trying to do. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jared, who's going to take us through the damn trends to watch in 2021. Jared? Great. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all for taking um, 30 minutes out of your very busy days, I'm sure. And uh, we, we do appreciate uh, so many of you uh, joining us for, for, this, for this call. So topic today is around trends to watch in the digital asset management world for 2021. Um, I can tell you we've been working very hard on our research, constantly updating our vendor chapters, and we've noticed a, a bunch of trends. This, you know, if there's one thing I can say about digital asset management as we sit here in 2021 is that it remains a pretty vibrant marketplace. You know, all, different marketplaces adapt at different speeds, but DAM continues to surprise us and, and it continues to adapt, continue, continues to change um, in, in some really fundamental ways. And, and so today I'm gonna share with you 
six big trends that we that we've noticed uh, in in recent days, and, and hopefully hopefully that helps all of you. So trend number one is the marketplace is we've noticed some marketplace splits that align with people's journey stages. So in order for me to explain this, I'm going to have to talk about what I mean by your journey journey stages. So, so we've been talking about this a lot. You may have seen us uh, publish the, this graphic before, but sometimes I like to talk about your your enterprise's journey with digital asset management as a as a in terms of phases. So maybe dam phase one would be you know dam 1.0, phase two would be dam 2.0, and phase three you know dam 3.0. And I, I think it's really important to to understand that a couple big key themes here. Number one. No one's figured this out completely. No one's completed their damn journey, you know, uh, you know, in, in, you know, perfectly, I should say. Um, as we go through the different phases, I, I think it's, you know, there's there's no absolute right destination that is one size fits all for every organization that we that we work with. So for some of you, DAM 1.0 may be your goal destination. Um, for some of you, DAM 2.0 is where you want to get, and some of you 3.0, and some of you are even thinking beyond 3.0, and we'll talk a little bit about what that might mean as well. So DAM 1.0 is something that we uh, kind of label as a DAM as a standalone library. So what I mean by that is you're, you're probably using your digital asset management system as, as one step beyond a, a, a set of um, you know, file shares on, you know, maybe you're using your Z drive, your G drive, your H drive, you know, as a way to, to share files within your organization, or maybe you're using cloud uh, file sharing tools like the Dropboxes or the Box or even, even collaboration tools like SharePoint. Um, uh, uh, doing true digital asset management, managing assets through a proper life cycle um, is usually one step beyond that. So that you've taken a leap beyond those cloud file sharing tools, beyond those share drive, and you have that single repository now for managing images, video, and audio, audio files through a life cycle. Now, one key characteristic of the standalone library in DAM 1.0 is that typically this library, the single source of your assets, is disconnected from your larger technical stack. So again, for some of you, that's okay. For some of you, that's it, it's still better than what you had before in, in, a, in a shared file. Um, environment maybe this is at least you have some single source to, to house your assets but in essence what you've done is you've created another destination to go put assets and then retrieve them but by nature of a standalone environment you're you need to go to that system upload it and then pull it out and then do something else with it right and so there's a lot of different steps there and, and again that might work well for your organization but for for many organizations and in 2021, you know, this is just a step in the journey to something much more connected. Let's talk about the next step, something we call DAM 2.0 or DAM as a MarTech service. So here, I know many many of the folks on the call. You come from different uh, different industries, you know, spread all across uh, all across across the globe, but you know, very different business models, very different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, from Fortune 500 to, to you know much more you know SMB oriented or or even even really um, really small organizations, um, but many of you are thinking about how can I connect my digital asset management system, my single source of, of truth, if you will, for your for your uh, audio and video and, and image assets, how can you connect that to be more part of your of your MarTech stack? So in this environment, we see DAM as a critical part of this workflow. And so, you know, in this environment, we see upstream integration and downstream in integration. So what do I mean by that? You know, you have your creative team, you know, working in in you know the Photoshop's and Illustrators and and, and other uh, creative creative type tools, and then you 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 save those assets into a dam system, and then that dam system then powers your sy other systems of engagement. So things like your web content management system, things like your social publishing tools, or your marketing automation system. So it's a it's a flow of information through your enterprise where dam is that critical source for your assets. But uh, you know I think it's important to note here that. In in a typically in a typical DAM 2.0 world for most organizations, it is truly a one-way flow of information. 
you know, from upstream to the dam to downstream out into the channels and, and reaching all of your constituents. In a 3.0 world, I think that we need, to, we need to start to rethink some things. We need to expand our definition of what is an asset. And so we're calling the 3.0 world, you know, something akin to a, an omni-channel content platform. So you notice I'm, I'm not even using the term asset necessarily. I'm thinking about content writ large. So I'm thinking of a world where we're managing content we're managing media, narrative, data, as well as images, video, and audio files, all as first-class objects in a, in a, in a tightly, uh, tightly related way. In order to do that, I think we need to get into some real, much more sophisticated relationships between content types and, and, and assets, for that matter, um, to really be able to do the types of things that, that I'll describe later on today. Um, and I, I think a, a, big, a big characteristic of, of the 3.0 world is many organizations who are at the stage, they wanna be able to use this repository, whether it's your dam system or you might call it your, your OCP, your omnichannel content platform. You wanna use that repository as a place to kind of bring analytics back and, and you know, from, from what's happening in all these channels. So, you know, you, you're measuring analytics on the web, you're measuring analytics in the social world, you're me measuring analytics in a whole variety of different sources. There's no shortage of data in any of our organizations, right? But people are saying, well, that's all well and good, but what if we could bring them back to a single source so that we could then use that data to inform future creative decisions? So that's where this notion of we, we get a, we, we depart from that 2.0 world where there's this one way of flow of information in a 3.0 world i think there's a there's a round trip of data and so that 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 information becomes becomes a two-way flow and so if you think about where you are, are on that journey or where you want to get to on your journey i think that's really important as you start to look at vendors because in our research we found that different vendors are much more suited for different phases in these journeys. Um, and, and so as we evaluate these tools, this is really what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the crux of what these vendors are good at, what they're not so good at, where they're a good fit, where they're not such a good fit. But you'll, you'll find that different vendors very much align to, to different, different phases of this journey. And if you wanna get to a 3.0 world, you're gonna need a, 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 a small subset of these vendors. If you wanna get to a 2.0 world, that your, your world, your options are going to be increased. If you want to get to a 1.0 world, then there's no sense buying a 3.01. <laughs> you know, so so there's there's a there's a real risk of underbuying and overbuying. Maybe more more risk of overbuying in, in today's world. But it's, it's something to, to think about and and really make sure you align your your ambitions with with what vendors are are best suited to get you there. So with that as some backdrop, I think I think you're going to see some common themes as we go as we go through the, the rest of the trends. You know, all tying back to these to those those phases of, of your journey. But but trend number two is is something we're calling the rise of the never finished asset. And so you know, back ten years ago when we were all thinking about Dam as a, as a standalone library, and we were all thinking in terms of a 1.0 world, I, I think we thought we saw digital asset management systems as the place where finished assets go to be managed through the rest of their life, right? I think in today's day and age, we need to think about assets as, uh, in a more sophisticated way. And, 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 and I'm gonna talk about something more sophisticated, but I'm gonna do it in a very simplistic example here. But um, you know, think about, think about personalization. Everyone's talking about personalization and personalization means a whole slew of different things to a whole slew of different pe people as we, as we think about creating personalized experiences to our constituents. But in the asset world, you know, there's a there's been a real big push to, to say, how can we personalize our assets? You know, and here's a very simple example where we're saying happy anniversary, Karen, on a, on a uh, you know, embedded on top of a, another uh, image, right? And so, but if you think about this, the image on the left is something we might want to store. And the image on the right is, is a derivation of that, that we might want to, we might want to store very closely to the image on the left. And if we change something to the image on the left, does that impact the image on the right? You know, is there a, a parent-child relationship here? Is there a sibling relationship here? How, how, how does that, how does, uh, how does metadata traverse down through related assets? How does, uh, how do changes traverse down? How do notifications work? It seems like a very simple thing, but it has some really important technical uh, implications on the, back, on, the, on the back end as you start to think about, about these challenges. Another 
very real example is is real time asset manipulation. Um, you know, here's a, again a very simple example where you have an asset on the left and you you want to put a promo or something on it on, on the right. We heard a very real example recently where the founder of a company uh, unfortunately passed away, and for a period of time they they actually made all of their product imageries black and white. You know, and, and because they had they had set their their dam system and connected it to their to their web uh, platform. They were able to do that at a, at, a, at a push of a button, and it was really easy for them to do. Uh, but but that real time asset manipulation is a is a is a trend that that buyers want and vendors and some vendors are are responding to, but not all. But the, but the key takeaway here, I think, is we need to we need to think about the sophistication at the back end to provide these capabilities, you know, to provide personalization, to provide real-time asset manipulation. You need you need a system that can fundamentally handle these types of complicated relationships, right? You need you need to be able to handle those compound um, asset management scenarios where it's not just a, a single asset we're talking about. You're talking about an asset in many parts potentially. Um, and, and that's and that's something that uh, I think is only going to become more and more prevalent in, in our in our worlds. I also think we need to start expanding our our notion a little bit, our expanding our definition of what is an asset, right? And I think there's there's case where we need to think about text and even even things as code or HTML, you know, as first class objects. And maybe we we start managing things like micro experiences as discrete assets with a whole set of components um, that we use to, to, to build into those micro experiences. Um, and, and, and as we as we start to head in that direction, and so many of you are, this is such a real phenomenon. Um, I think some of you are being held back by your current digital asset, asset management systems, and some of you are being driven by some real sophisticated thinking from, from vendors who might have been ahead of the game, but now, now buyers are ready to, to kind of take advantage of, of those services. So, there's a lot happening in the marketplace, and again, um, I think I think this is a this this notion of a never finished asset is, is is a big one. Trend number three is something that we've been following for quite a bit of time in the damn world, and that's this skill set shortage, uh, and it, it's almost become critical on two fronts. So number one, you know, just this notion of if we're moving into a 2.0, 3.0 world, just by definition, our our digital asset management systems are not these standalone dams in, in, in those phases, right? They are truly connected. They're connected by in technical capacities, you know, where where you know it's literally a, a, a system is passing data and content to another system, and you need to make sure the user experience flows correctly, as well as the right data fields and, and the right content get gets you know flows correctly, and we're we're doing proper proper development there to to make sure that as our as our technologies uh, progress, that we're able to uh, stay on a consistent upgrade path. And so, whereas in the past, we might have been able to just get away with um, the vendor professional services we got uh, that came with the, the product that we bought, but we've seen more recently um, internal technical capacities being applied to the dam world, as well as a whole slew of third party uh, uh, integrators come to the table to kind of supplement what you get from the vendor in your own teams. Um, unfortunately, it's get at war. Fortunately, it's getting better, but unfortunately, there's 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 a dearth of people who really understand digital asset management in 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 that third party inter integrator space. There are some, but there's a lot that say they are and they really don't get it. And that we've seen that that, that skill shortage really caused some challenges there. So if you need some advice on on you know what to look out for when 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 selecting a third party integrator or some best practices to go about to, to really test them you know let us know that's something we've been helping a, a whole slew of clients recently with and then don't forget the softer non-technical skills i mean the good news is that metadata development taxonomy development information architecture these have been some things that have been thought of in high regard in the damn world as opposed to some of the other spaces that we cover which is which is good but I can tell you the you know the language that you're speaking within these systems it's not it's critical to integrations right so it's not just a technical integration if, if one system is speaking one language and the one system is speaking another language these integrations are get messy really quickly right and so Good taxonomists are are critical in today's day and age, and good taxonomists that understand DAM is 
really critical and they're hard to find. In fact, I, I this is a bunch that we work with that are booking like about a year out right now. Um, so that, that scares me and, and, and causes, uh, causes uh, me to be concerned for some of my clients in, in that respect. And then as we think about, you know, those more complicated relationships we need to support, information architects are really critical to that as well. You know, how granular should you be storing your, your components and, and, and how, could you, how should be, you be managing those relationships on a real sophisticated level? Really important to, to consider it uh, before it's too late. Trend number four. Everyone talks about everything as a service, so it's not surprising that we're at a point where we're talking about content as a service or assets as, as a service. I'm not even going to try to pronounce what assets as a service might be because I'm going to get myself in trouble there. But think about assets or a more expanded view of assets like we, like I mentioned earlier, maybe some omni-channel content. Think about it this as, as a basic building block to experiences. And this is a bit of a complicated screen here, but if you work your way from the bottom up, you know, many of you, you know, are very much involved with your creative operations and your content operations. And that involves, you know, resource management and project management and scheduling. And then there's this workflow of creative that goes through a goes through an approval approval cycle and review cycle. And then eventually it's declared that, hey, this is ready to be to be used. And, and you know, so there's cer certainly digital asset management services that start to handle those 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 uh, creations through a life cycle. And then maybe those assets and are, are are started to be combined with other components, maybe maybe data and micro narratives start to get combined. And so those types of services are then powering all of these other systems of engagement. You know, maybe your e-commerce uh, uh, publishing uh, platforms, your web publishing platforms, your marketing automation to handle outbound campaigns, your social media publishing tools, your, and maybe you're even powering systems where your Salesforce work on a daily basis. You know, maybe it's they work within a, a a call center, or or they're using Salesforce to manage relationships, and and so maybe you want to provide them with the same assets that you're putting on the web, so that someone who's visiting the website and calling your your support line, maybe they're communicating the right information. And so, if you think about this, you don't have to necessarily think of every one of these boxes as a discrete system. In your world, it might be. But in some cases, you might have one system to handle your digital asset management and your omni-channel content service, services. Or maybe today you might have two, but when you get to a 3.0 world, maybe it, it becomes one. But, but ultimately, the message here that I want to think about is content, whether it's in a digital asset management or an omni-channel content management system or something, something combined, is a basic fundamental building block to building experiences as are data and decisioning. So if you think about content, data, and decisioning, these are the basic building blocks, building experiences. If you can power all your other systems of engagement in a way, then, then your assets become a service, your content becomes a service to everyone who's, who's building experiences in your enterprise. Really important. So next up is something we're calling predictive performance of assets. So this is a bit future gazing, but uh, you know, when I was talking about the DAM 3.0 environment, we were talking about that two-way flow of information and, and round-tripping analytics back to a DAM, which is a great first step. But I'm calling this predictive uh, nature uh, or performance of assets, I think it's more of a DAM 4.0 or at least a DAM 3.5 for many organizations. And what I mean by that is I think our content repositories are going to really start to get smarter. Right, so it's not going to be just us looking at the data and saying, "Oh, that performed better than that." Let's just let's uh, let's do something like that, like the one that performed better next time around. That's all well and good and a big step in the right direction. But I think we're going to start to see these systems using artificial intelligence, using machine learning, to start to really help us make decisions in a more meaningful way. Like for example, you know, I, t today we could say uh, which 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 asset performed better, A or B. Um, we might log into our future system and say, hey, we're we're doing a uh, we're doing a um, a campaign that we're targeting the the Southwest United States, and based on this criteria, why don't you tell why doesn't the system tell me which asset they think it thinks would be would perform best based on based on past data could be interesting for for many of you i think it becomes particularly interesting though when we think about the power of this at scale 
So instead of us going to our digital asset management systems and scouring through everything that we've used before and trying to make sense of what, what's performed better in the past, what if we could start to bubble up higher or better performing uh, content uh, to our to our experienced creators? What if we can, you know, and we think about that at scale, you know, today we're so reliant on our content and experienced creators to, to do a lot of this work for us. And oftentimes they just create something new, but what if the systems that we're employed, what if they could, start to really bubble things up and, and, and take some of those decisions out of, uh, out of our hands or at least suggest things better so that we spend a lot of less time churning, looking through a whole a whole repository of, of assets that, that for many of you has just grown, grown and grown to a, to a really unwieldy state. And finally, trend number six, you know, I think oh, hopefully we're all coming out of this pandemic and, 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 you know, I think for many of us, things have turned. I know some of us are still going going through some tough times, but I, I think what, if there's one thing that we've seen is that the pandemic has caused roadmap acceleration. I can't tell you how many people that we've talked to that said, you know, we didn't have a choice. We had to, we had a plan to, to execute this five, 10 year roadmap and we're already, we're already on year seven of that you know, in, in, in the last 12 months. You know, we had to speed things up. We had to change, change what, what, the way we were working. And that's great for many of you. I, I think we're gonna see some really impressive impacts in the, in the, in the next, you know, short, medium and long term from, from many of your organizations. But I throw this out as a caution because I think there's, and we're already starting to see this, in a rush to speed up, that's when mistakes happen. Right, and so I see. Uh, I've already started seeing people call us up and say, you know, we we kind of rushed this and and we picked this vendor, and now we're hitting some roadblocks pretty early. And yeah, I was, and and it's it's hard for me to say, but I but I but I do, and I you know I say, well, I, I don't think that's the right product for what it is you're trying to do. And and I and, and I think you're going to continue to to experience turbulence if you go down go down the path there. So sometimes or oftentimes I want to encourage all of you to kind of pump the brakes here, go fast where you, where you, where you can, but make sure you do your due diligence in the selection process, really test these vendors as to their appropriateness to your unique needs. They are not one size fits all technologies and you will feel the pain if you pick the wrong vendor. So we always recommend applying design thinking principles to tech selection, you know, make sure that you're, you create a process that's very testable in nature, that's very agile in nature, that you're able to adapt as you go along and, and continue to learn as you go about it, but test, 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 and winnow it down so that you're taking a lot of the risk out of this process that you pick the wrong vendor. And if you do adhere to a design thinking uh, methodology to tech selection, your chances of su success are gonna be much, much higher. So just to recap, Market splits are aligning with journey stages. Make sure you find a vendor that aligns with where you are at and where you want to go. Be conscious of this notion of a, the never finished assets and the implications from a technical standpoint that that has. Really be aware of the critical skill shortages that exist. And you know, as you look at your own roadmaps, that this could really impact that. Make sure you have the right technical skills, but also the right softer skills and in terms of uh, taxonomy and metadata and information architecture and usability consultants and that kind of thing. Be aware of content and assets as potentially a service to your other systems. So you, the notion of logging into a, a digital asset management system or an omnichannel content platform may not even be a, a consideration for many of you. Maybe assets just get delivered to you in the in the places that you work in the in the future in a way that is really invisible. So I think that's that's a very real thing that's going to happen. And I'm happy to talk. To, to, to all of you about uh, about how, how that's really manifesting itself at some real forward thinking enterprises today. And then I think as, as we get into a 3.0 and beyond world, thinking about how can machine learning um, start to predict performance of assets and, and help us scale our environments and, and, and experience creation in a, in a more meaningful way. And then be aware of, of rushing these projects. You know, I, I, I can't state that enough. You know, we, we preach the, the right way to select technology quite a bit. It's, it's something that we wrote a book on and we're very proud of our methodology because quite frankly, it works. If you do this right, you can be successful at this, but shortcuts, speeding things up unnecessarily and, and, and speeding up in the wrong areas can lead to some really critical mistakes that quite frankly can cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And, and, and we've seen so many organizations on 
go through this this process and do fits and starts multiple multiple times and, and i just want to avoid that as, as much as you can if anyone wants a copy of the book you can check it out at rosenfeld media if anyone wants to wants to check out our latest digital uh, asset management research feel free to log on to realstorygroup.com and, and download a sample thank you all so much if anyone has any questions feel free to contact me via via linkedin or here's my email jay jingris at real story group happy to continue the conversation Thank you all. Have a great day.